FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You're listening to the Financial Survival Network. We're in early January, so what show is complete without forecast predictions for the coming year? We've got Jason Burek with us now from Wall Street for Main Street. Site's currently getting expanded, under construction, so you'll have to go to the YouTube channel to get the latest, but he's here with us now. Jason, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Kerry. Hey, so we got some things to go over here and your thoughts, predictions for 2015. We're all anxious to hear them. So why don't we start with interest rates around the so-called free world, which means the US, Japan, UK, EU, uh, financial repression. Um, is it a yes for 2015 and into the future or will they have to start actually raising them. No, I, I I don't think they will do whatever they have to do, whether it's change rules, market interventions, currency swaps, interest rate swaps, in order to uh, increasing positions in these derivatives types of contracts and things like that, backdoor bailouts, stealth QE, in order to prevent interest rates from spiking. Um, we did see interest rates spike uh, very briefly in uh, 2013. Um, I thought we may see another, you know, heart murmur or something like that in 2014. Uh, we did not see that. Um, and the more I study about financial repression, which is something, you know, another one of your guests, Gordon T. Long. Oh, sure. Um, I'm friends with Gordon, too. Um, I think he does an excellent job on this. Um, the mainstream media does not cover this at all. You watch CNBC or Bloomberg, you will not hear financial repression mentioned once, which is why the, you know, experts, and I'll use those in quotes, you know, the mainstream uh, longtime Wall Street people on uh, on CNBC and Bloomberg, they all expect rates will rise. But when you work out the math um, for, for Europe, for Japan, for the United States, States, for uh, England, the UK, you see that they can't let the interest rates rise. So maybe there there might be a really short, brief period of time where the interest rates rise, but they're, they're going to keep this game going as long as they can. And the only way they can do that, uh, by uh, they, can, they obviously can't pay back the principal on the debt carry. The only way that they can do that is to um, is to just keep lowering the interest rates through whatever manipulation uh, or whatever scheme they can so they can pay off the interest payments. And um, there's historical evidence, um, a lot of it, um, whether it's Reinhard or Rogoff's book, which I think went back 900 years, or I, I just finished um, financial historian Niall Ferguson's book, The Great Degeneration. It's only, um, it was a short book, but uh, basically he was just talking about England and he was talking about how the British Empire used financial oppression for a very long time. And people were uh, saying, you know, how the British Empire was going to crash. Um, there was a lot of people uh, trying to time it earlier and it just kept going and going. Their uh, borrowing exploded, you know, with central banking, with, uh, with a, uh, you know, when they removed themselves from a gold and silver standard. And, um, you know, people thought, you know, interest rates would spike, but the debt just kept exploding and um, the interest rates just kept going lower and lower, you know, due to market intervention and financial repression until, you know, finally, at some point, the currency just broke. I think George Soros busted the currency, although, you know, if it wasn't George Soros, it would have been someone else um, because, you know, I, I think Japan is just running out of road first, but uh, the, U the U.S. is uh, not not too much further behind. Yeah, well, there is some kind of limit, you know, the Minsk, so-called Minsky moment. And, you know, dollar will probably be last. It's what I've always believed. Uh, but, you know, right now we're in the uh, meme that we're in deflation now. But they still are inflating the, uh, the money supply, regardless what, they, uh, what figures they might publish. I'm convinced that, uh, that that's what they're doing. It, it, exactly. And, um, you know, my grocery bill carries since 2005 when, uh, well, 2006, when I graduated college, my grocery bills up a lot and I eat less. So, um, yes, I do eat more high quality food, but, um, I do eat a lot less. And when I have like normal food, that's not, you know, grass fed beef or, um, organic fruits and vegetables, I noticed the price on those things has gone up a lot too. And, um, what, what, one thing that I would add is, um, I recently had a local conversation, uh, a conversation with a local businessman here. He's successful. Uh, he has under graduate degree from Cal Berkeley, uh, master's degree from Yale uh, in economics and political science from Yale. So extremely smart, well-educated, won't mention his name. Uh, anyway, though, he, um, you know, he's, he just talks about deflation, everything mainstream, refuses to acknowledge 
that there's any asset price inflation whatsoever. So um, yes, there's a lot of inflation in the developing world in Russia with the ruble dropping and and uh, other developing countries. There is clearly inflation in the food bills and things like that, despite the oil price dropping. Maybe that's although um, I think the oil price dropping is just basically temporary. Uh, I think people should enjoy it while it lasts and enjoy this cheap gasoline. But um, I, I think this asset price inflation is really the main thing because of the debt levels that we mentioned here that almost everyone, all the trend trading, all the hedge fund people, the institutions, the banks, whether it's real estate or bonds or stocks, these guys are all holding um, assets carry with enormous amounts of leverage. So I I think the goal with the Fed, with financial repression, the wealth effect is to use a controlled amount of inflation and stagflation, lie about it, and to um, to keep the asset prices boosted, so these institutions that are holding these assets, whether you know it's it's a hedge fund or a, an investment bank or a regular bank, they don't look insolvent. So I think the goal has been to prop up the asset prices and nominal value in the major asset classes at at pretty much all costs. Um, we we may have a we may have a, a brief period here where you know the central banks lose control, um, like Lehman Brothers after two thousand eight, where there was contagion. Uh, we may have a you know where the stock market does temporarily early crash. But um, based on the way I see the world now and the way I see central bank policy, uh, I don't think they'll allow the asset prices to stay low for more than six to 12 months again without, you know, QE4, uh, 200 billion uh, printed per month or something along those lines. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree with you. And, you know, remember the definition of inflation isn't increased increased, uh, consumer prices. It's an increase in the money supply, right? It, it, exactly, and the the higher consumer prices or higher higher asset prices is the effect. It's 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 a symptom of inflation. It's not the cause. Exactly. But um, but I I mean this this is just getting off on technicalities. These are the Keynesians like Paul Krugman, or if you watch CNBC or Bloomberg, like Steve Leisman is one of the main guys. Oh, there is no inflation, right? They don't count asset prices going up like crazy. But if you read uh, von Mises or Rothbard, any mm-hmm. Austrian school economist, they'll talk about there is once there is inflation in the money supply or credit, there is no no way to prevent this inflation from getting into the asset prices. So normally, e- even von Mises said and Rothbard said, it's going to go into the asset prices first. This is with the Ken- Kentione effect. Richard Kentione, he was an Austrian mm-hmm. school economist before there was an Austrian school economist. He was one of the richest men in the world, I think, around John Law's time. So he right. saw asset bubbles and um, the money went into the asset prices first. So this yeah. is what we've seen now, especially in the developed world. Um, the money, a lot of the inflation, um, yes, you know, my, my healthcare bills are up, my food bills are up, but the Major, the overwhelming majority of the inflation created globally has gone into asset prices first, or it's been exported um, into the developing world, into the global supply chain. Yeah, and that's what I want to emphasize because Martin um, Armstrong had a recent article about Keynesians versus uh, versus Austrians, and you know somebody said they're both wrong, or they've both been wrong for the past four years, and it's important to understand that uh, that. Austrians don't predict, okay? Not the purpose of Austrian economics. Never has been, right? Not out there predicting where the economy's going day to day, week to week, right? Exactly. And the Austrians don't do modeling and stuff. So it's the Keynesians who are doing the modeling and trying to guess, and almost all their models are wrong. They're doing these aggregate demand models, trying to model all these factors and variables and things like that in equations. But I I mean, the Austrians with the boom and the bust and the credit cycle, um, I I mean, it's something. Why it happens. Well, but, well, 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 when you, when you go to credit, Kerry, I mean, the, the, the income's not rising, the revenues are not rising, they cannot support the debt levels. OK, yeah. so so that this is why credit is so dangerous. I mean, whether you're you're running your own business um, and using uh, a lot of credit and your revenues aren't rising or it's your own family and you're using credit cards for emergencies or other things uh, at the th- this is how things work at all levels of society. But, you know, except for what the central banks are doing. Yeah. So it's it's just at some point can't can't give you an exact time on this. The credit system we're going to have another potentially 2008. Either it's going to be in, um, you know, uh, they're not going to be able to keep things in a worsening stagflation with financial mm-hmm. repression with the wealth effect. They're not going to be able to keep this in this scenario indefinitely. Even with all these central banks uh, coordinating, you know, whether it's with currency swaps or whatever, they're not going to be able to to keep this indefinitely in a scenario like this. It's going to be 2008 
or it's going to be um, you know, worse on the inflation curve. It's going to move one way or the other on the pendulum. So um, it, it, I can't give you an exact date, but um, I mean, people should be preparing for, um, for a scenario like this, because, uh, especially if you don't pay attention to markets every day, because um, there's just so much going behind, on behind the scenes. If you only looked at the Dow, you would think, oh, you know, uh, you spend your five or 10 minutes a day, right? Looking at your 401k, your IRA. Oh, my, my stocks are up. Oh, everything's great. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I just wanted to make that point because, well, I respect uh, Martin Armstrong greatly, especially his forecasting skills. I think has second to none. Has Martin even read an Austrian school book, though? Did, did you? Ask? I think he's under a mistaken impression about uh, what Austrian economics is is all about because it's not about forecasting and prediction. It's a system of thought, a discipline about why things occur the way they do. Yeah. And well, hey, you know, before there was Austrian economics, before money printing uh, existed, there were booms and busts, right? Uh, but they generally, there generally weren't multiple bubbles the economy worked yeah. itself out. Great right. Depression in 1920, right? I mean, there's yeah. it's it's human nature to humans aren't perfect. We we run businesses. The businesses aren't perfect. They make investing mistakes. The market works it out. Businesses go bankrupt. People, yeah. um, you know, people up. Uh, uh, people are prudent. Buy up the assets. Uh, life moves on. Hey, and tulip mania, South Sea bubble. You know, these uh, manias have been with us, with humanity since the beginning of time. Um, nothing's going to change that. Uh, but Austrian economics explains why easy credit exacerbates these things and makes them uh, occur more regularly than, uh, you know, than, yep. than they would otherwise. So that's all, that's all I'm saying. And, um, yeah, I agree. You know, yeah. Credit's the most, credit's the most dangerous. Um, because, you know, if you're just doing it from savings, Okay, you lose some of your savings, right? You have cash flow coming in, you lose some of your savings. You know what? You took a calculated risk. Maybe you didn't calculate the risk as enough uh, uh, as much as you thought you were you were doing. You didn't do as much research, or you didn't look at the uh, at the downside uh, of the investment or trade or speculation. Um, and you know, businessmen are speculators. When you try uh, yeah. come out with a new product or service, this is speculation. Little You're on investors more than speculators, but they're well, making uh, informed. Well, speculation, put it that well, way. Well, uh, uh, entrepreneurs are basically speculators. I mean, you're speculating on an, on an industry. You are making an investment, but it's extremely risky, right? Hopefully you're really far on the cycle. Informed, hopefully informed. But yeah, I agree with you. Well, it's agree. Specula speculators are, no are normally informed. A lot of, whether you're, uh, there's a lot of informed speculators, but it's still, you know, high yeah. risk normally. Yeah, agreed. And, uh, and, but, you know, the point being, uh, hey, that, uh, Austrian economics is not about predicting. It's about explaining why things blow up more so than anything and explaining why credit is the cause of it. And you're going to have blow ups regardless whether there's credit or not easy money. But when you can just print money out of thin air, yeah, it's going to go all over the well, world when it's the reserve currency. No question about it. But uh, well, well cre credit yeah. is the worst, though, Kerry, because it can make the whole society insolvent. It, so it cre does. credit. Yeah. So if if the society was, you know, there were bubbles just from savings, it wouldn't be nearly as bad. It yeah. would just it, the society would would adjust like Great Depression 1920 wouldn't be nearly as bad. But when there's excessive amounts of credit, you know, way more times than world GDP, the derivatives market, stuff like that. That's when we're talking about, you know, um, you know, Armageddon type scenarios here with the credit and what the Keynesians and the, the other uh, the other stuff that's been done. Oh, yeah, we know that. So on to the next uh, item here. Interest rates basically more of the same because it's all part of financial repression. And let's face it, uh, as Chris uh, Martinson said, and uh, Gordon T. Long, uh, maintaining a stable gold price undervalued is also a tool of financial repression. So don't be surprised to see gold behaving uh, in a similar fashion the way it has, except that, you know, you've got the uh, Chinese and Russian demand as well as all the other countries in the world trying to grab their piece of it as well, right? 
Yeah, but what we're also and and Russia carry despite you know the stuff in the oil price, Russia is also putting um the majority of its uh, oil trade surplus monthly into gold. So and and then we're also starting to see carry kind of a redux of the London gold pool of the 1960s, where um you know France backed out of the London gold pool, they start asking for all their gold back. We're starting to see a repeat of that. So you know we've seen the Dutch central bank get their gold back. Germany is still um. Germany is still uh, asking for their gold. They're trying to get more of their gold back. Uh, I think they're in the process of getting a lot more of their gold back. And um, the new potential presidential candidate, uh, Austria asked for a gold audit. I think Australia asked for a gold audit recently. And um, the the last one is France. Um, and France has a pretty good gold reserve still, I believe. And um, the, fr- the potential next pr- uh, French presidential candidate, I think she's asked for to repatriate the gold. So kind of Charles de Gaulle, Jacques Roof, um, London Gold Pool. We may be having an example here of where the EU is getting really upset with the policy decisions, the economic warfare the US has put against Russia because it's kind of putting their natural, their stable natural gas supply uh, on the line here because Germany relies uh, heavily, very heavily on on Russian uh, oil and natural gas imports. And mm-hmm. so does um, the rest of Europe, especially for Russian natural gas. And with these economic warfare and sanctions on Russia, um, you know, Europe was kind of forced to go along being in NATO and stuff. Um, I, I don't think they really agreed with a lot of the sanctions that the U.S. has been putting in Russia and the economic warfare that the U.S. has done, uh, whether that's, you know, trying to destabilize Ukraine or the uh, the games in the oil market that I think the U.S. was involved in with Russia. So um, there, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, I, I, I think there's going to be a gold supply. I can't tell you exactly when, whether that's six months or 12 months or 18 months. But um, there's definitely gold supply issues because a lot of that, the demand for gold is still very strong. China bought up, um, according to Kuz Jansen, a bullion star, China already imported, I think, over 2,000 tons of gold 2014. They imported over 2,000 tons of gold 2013. That's 100% of the annual global mining supply. So, um, there's there uh, that the gold has to be coming from somewhere. So either it's coming from GLD or Western Central Banks. Um, I, I I don't know exactly. It's coming from one of those two sources. Uh, but um, the West has to be running out of gold here at some point. And um, you know, maybe then we might have a repeat of the London Gold Pool, where despite the best intentions of the people trying to manage that gold price, it just breaks up and they lose uh, control at some point. Could be. Could be. I wouldn't uh, doubt it. At some point something's going to give, right? Yeah, well, I, I, it just depends on what the next financial system is going to be, Carrie. So I, I think a lot of people are getting fed up with the petrodollar and the dollar as a world reserve currency for a whole bunch of different reasons, especially, you know, the U.S.'s decisions on foreign policy. I, I think there's a lot of WikiLeaks documents out there that the, the Germans uh, were very upset with uh, the U.S. deciding to, you know, go into Ukraine. I think the U.S. had been planning to go into Ukraine since 2009. So this 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 plan with, you know, uh, destabilize Ukraine to hurt Putin and and um, put sanctions on them and maybe attack the ruble in the currency wars and, um, and maybe hurt the oil price. I think this plan has been formulating for a while. So I, I think these countries are getting kind of fed up with the U.S.'s foreign policy. And I think that's why they're starting to transition and look into the next financial system. Uh, the next system is I don't think it's ready to go into into implementation completely in the next six months. But um, I mean, people, uh, the, the other countries, the G20, they see they see where this thing is going. They see the light at the end of the tunnel. And um, prior to 2008, the system wasn't in place to really mm-hmm. do these bilateral trade agreements, these potentially uh, gold back trade settlement, currency swaps and things like that. Um, and now we're seeing enormous amounts of currency swap announcements. I think we've seen China has already done 20 of them and they're very large, multi-billion dollar currency swaps. They did one with Canada recently. So it's it's they've been doing them with a lot of their Asian countries and other trading partners here. And um, I think they just did one with Russia to a very large one to uh, help stabilize the ruble. Yeah, well, going to get interesting. That's for sure. So oil. Okay, where are we with oil? You only got a minute or two. You got to be quick on it. Tell us where we're at. Well, I, I think you and me talked about this before. I think the majority of the world's oil production now is no longer economic. Um, in the short term, um, fundamentals don't really matter. Uh, I think all the Wall Street people, their hedge fund managers, their brother, their uncle, everyone's short oil. Um, it is a falling knife, 
But as a value investor and a contra- hardcore contrarian, it gets me excited. Uh, I'm, I've been buying a lot of personal positions in oil. I've been in there looking for profitable companies that have low production costs, not too much debt. And some of them are hedged. I think there's a lot of good value in MLPs. I can give out a few names. Uh, they're like Memorial Energy Partners is hedged. I think 90% of the oil production is hedged and they're doing a $150 million share buyback because they're so cheap. So Lynn Energy, Memorial Energy Partners, Vanguard Natural Resources, uh, Brightburn Energy, these companies are all hedged with the oil production. And those are the producers. The um, the midstream companies of the pipeline ones, though, those guys are in really good shape or the frac sand MLPs. And, um, you know, those get there's still a lot of frac sand being used an enormous amount still. Actually, it's increased a lot. And just because they had energy in their name or they were associated with an oil production, they dropped 40, 50 percent. So there's still a lot of good value in MLPs. People looking for yield. You have to do your homework, though. I would not be indiscriminate and buy. Um, I think the oil service companies are still in good shape too. And uh, the larger oil um, oil production companies, the Axons, the Chevrons, uh, those guys I think are in good shape too long term because they have a lot of natural gas production too as well. Yeah. And they'll be uh, scooping up, uh, they'll be going bargain hunting. Oh the yeah. Mediums and the larger ones are going bargain hunting for sure. So you'll be able to get some real buys there. Just make sure the cash flow is good and the, uh, and the debt isn't out of hand that it's serviceable, right? It, it, exactly, and if they're they're actually producing oil, if they're not if they're not a uh, midstream company or a pipeline company, make sure that they have some amount of their oil production hedged, maybe at a higher price. Yeah, yep, hedging important. Hey, what about airline stocks? Uh, they're definitely a, at least a temporary beneficiary of all this, right? Yeah, they're a temporary beneficiary. I have a hedge fund manager friend of mine who was sh- who who was trying to short these things about six months ago. I think he got absolutely killed. But um, yeah, I mean the airline business in general is not a good long term business to invest in, especially American airline companies with all the you know the rules, regulation, unions, um, things like that. Actually, I flew up to Toronto, Kerry, in September, and um, uh, it was like a two hundred something dollar ticket, and my uh, airline tax was ninety dollars on the ticket. So it was it was a forty yeah. percent tax for my airline ticket. It was insane. So this is, it's, it's not really a great business and they're nickel and diming you right now, but I mean, in general, I don't think it's a really great business as a trade. So, um, mm-hmm. maybe if you're long airline stocks with options or something as a hedge, as a trade, I, I don't think it's a good long-term investment to be invested in a large, um, bureaucratically run type of airline companies with all these rules and regulations. Some of the foreign, foreign airline companies are pretty efficiently run, but the, um, the Western ones, the American ones are very bureaucratic. Understood. Hey. Uh, so sites down, where's the best place to find you now? Uh, just wall, wall street for main street, uh, W L L S T F R M E I N S T, uh, on YouTube, or they can, uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Jason, a letter E as an Elliot and in Burek, my last name. All right. And you find links as usual in the show notes, the interview on financial survival network.com. Make sure you uh, sign up for a free newsletter. That way you'll get advised of any webinars we'll be having, which probably have one later this month. Anyway, Jason, happy investing and have a great 2015. And we'll be checking in with you periodically. You be well. You too. Thank you. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Every week the show is growing. Would you like to be a part of it? Then go to clubfsn.com and help support us with one, two, five, or ten dollars a month and get a host of premium content with newsletters dropped into your mailbox, free books, private audio clips, webinars, and much more. Then join clubfsn.com. If you want to get ahead of the trend and ensure your family's financial security before it's too late, go to clubfsn.com. FSN.com and sign up. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.